the one thing that screams at me the whole way through this is connection, connection, connection. And be prepared that when your child goes from primary school to secondary school, they're going to change and they're going to try and disconnect from me. And that's totally normal. But you've got to keep that relationship with them. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Noreen Turley. And in this podcast, we have a very interesting subject. We're going to talk about the HSE Youth Drug and Alcohol Services, known really to a lot of people in the business, I suppose, as Yoda. We've got Emer Lockery here today. She is a counselling psychotherapist. So hi, Emer, how are you? And we have Dr. Monica White, who is a systemic family psychotherapist. Hi, Noreen. Hi, lovely to have you here today, ladies, and thank you very much. So I think what we should probably do is just start from the very beginning and ask you guys, what is the youth drug and alcohol services? It's a good place to start. Yeah. So I suppose we are a multidisciplinary team. So that basically means there's a couple of different disciplines on our team. We work with young people and their parents, young people who are engaged in drug and alcohol use. And that's young people who are, I suppose, at a point of experimentation right up to the point where young people become more dependent on their drug and alcohol use and it's interfering with their daily functioning, really. So that's, I suppose, in essence, what Mm -hmm. we do. Yeah, we cover a large catchment of Dublin, which is mostly from Southside Dublin, from Tallaght right down to Inchicore and Ringsend. And all of our clients are under 18. Yeah, OK, so, so ages, what age could it start at? Well, the youngest 11, 12, 11, 12 okay, up to yeah. about 18. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. OK, and who refers into you? Do you have to get a referral or can you self-refer? So pr- predominantly the majority of our referrals actually do come from families. So about, okay. about half of our referrals are from the families directly themselves who are in our catchment. And it's just about a matter of picking up the phone and giving us a call. And then after that, I suppose we would have referrals from schools, social workers, we've had youth workers referring, a okay. whole variety of services and I suppose mental health services. Mental health services yeah. would be. Yeah. So if somebody has an issue and they're willing to come to see you guys, then you'll take the referral. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Yeah. 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 And just, uh, you know, I'm not very familiar with this, but I suppose you guys are dealing with it every day. What are the substances that are out there at the moment? What are that age group using, I suppose? It's a really good question. And I suppose if we do this in a couple of years time, it's probably going to keep changing. Yeah, I suppose the main substances we see coming in the door are primarily, I suppose, cannabis is the main drug of choice for a lot of the young people attending our service. And after that, it's alcohol. And then I suppose you're moving into the likes of nitrous oxide. And I suppose nitrous oxide is, I suppose, a a very kind of big, big word for a substance that a lot of young people are actually inhaling. How do they inhale it? They, it's, it's it's using a balloon actually is how they use it. Okay. So nitrous oxide is, is, is a substance that's typically used. I suppose my my understanding of it was, was when you're in labour having a baby is kind yeah. of how they use. But it's it's something that is being abused and young people are buying it in, in large quantities. And is um, it easy to get? It's absolutely very easy to get, really? unfortunately, yes. And I suppose there's a lot of people out there that probably don't realise the damage it actually causes, mm. but it gives you a very quick effect. Young people really like it and it's you won't spot it too easily as a parent, actually. Mm. It gives them kind of a little bit of a slight drunken kind of feel and then it's gone. Um, it's odourless. So it doesn't last. And it's, odorless. And it's odorless. You can't doesn't pick last up a long. smell. No. You know, so with some other substances like cannabis, you might be able to smell yes. it. You know, with alcohol, you can definitely smell it. But with the nitrous oxide, you can't smell it. You know. OK. So, and uh, what about with cannabis then and vaping now? That's one thing that because we've done podcasts and vaping yeah. and we've done mm. webinars and yeah. people are constantly saying that the introduction, I suppose, of vapes, that it's just become more prevalent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a massive concern for mm. ourselves and lots of people are working in the area and, and, and parents, I'm sure, who are listening today kind of wonder what's going on. But yes, I suppose not just the young people are coming to us, but I suppose a lot of their peers would, would definitely communicate that there is a, a pr- fair proportion of young people who are vaping and you've got the nicotine vapes and then you have what's now known as THC vapes and they are a form of synthetic drug and they are giving young people the effect of, of cannabis, I suppose. Okay. And I suppose the age 
does appear that it's starting a bit younger. It's starting a bit younger. And also because with vaping, you don't know how what it equates to. So, for example, how many cigarettes or what would be equivalent in a vape? Mm. So that kind of messaging isn't out there. So people don't actually know how much how much nicotine they're using over the course of a day mm. or two days. Yeah. And that can be quite difficult, you know. And then with alcohol as well, it tends to be a lot of the time with alcohol, people are, are using very secretly or it may be kind of mm. with their friends. And for that, because alcohol is so cheap as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's easier for young people to access it now. Mm. So as we didn't mention, I suppose then obviously there's ketamine, co- <gasps> cocaine, MDMA, ecstasy so there'd be other substances we do actually see and benzodiazepines yeah. they're probably more I suppose as a lesser group coming to us or using some of them at the moment but they there's a will be a, a cross of young people using poly poly drug use really and, and kind of engaging in a couple of different kind of substances but predominantly cannabis would be their main drug of choice and then they're maybe trying other substances maybe at the okay. weekend and that's kind of a typical yeah. presentation to our yeah. service. So supposing somebody is referred into you and yeah. a child arrives, OK, I mean, like you say, from 11 to 18 and they sit in the chair in front of you. What do you see or how do you think the child is feeling at that time? Yeah. Well, I think we, we kind of start further back than that. Yeah. We, okay. actually, we actually start with a young person looking at when they come up to our service, it's kind of child orientated and child friendly. Okay. So a lot of the time, you know, we realised that between the door of the service and actually sitting in the room, we yeah. have a little bit of work to do with the young person to make them feel comfortable. So we would invite them in. We would show them around. We show them our rooms. We show them where they're going to be sitting. We could offer them a cup of tea or coffee or a glass of water just to try to make them feel comfortable. And are they with their parent at this stage or their yeah. Yeah. guardian or whatever? Yeah. They are. Yeah. OK, mm-hmm. sorry to interrupt you there. Go yeah. ahead. So then when a young person comes in, they can expect to meet one of the staff or several of the staff mm. members as well. And we will take them in with their parents and sit with them and try and tease out, get a picture really of what the issues are that they're struggling with and dealing with Mm. as a family. And because our service doesn't just deal with the young person, we also offer services to family members as well. So and that makes it easier for a young person to attend because we're kind of saying, yes, we'll be working with you. But actually, by the way, your parents will also be doing some work with us, too. So, so you look at the whole family. Yeah. Yeah, well you, and yeah, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that helps to destigmatize the young person a little bit, you know. I suppose the research would be strong and kind of telling us that a whole family approach to a substance use problem is really the best way to go. Mm. And really it is by, by trying to have the best outcomes for everybody. Going back to your question earlier on, what's it like for the young person? I suppose it, it is a really good question. And it's it's probably the bit that we work really hard to try and get right because it's a really scary place for a young person and going into any service where there's going to be a therapy component for a child is hard but absolutely you've got the extra layer of it being about substance use and a lot of words have been used language like addiction or you know I can't even mention some of the other words because I find it even hard to yeah. say them but really negative connotations and a lot of young people are coming into the room with that in their head and they actually think that we might think like that too so okay. we have a lot of work to try and convince young people that actually we certainly don't use the word addiction we don't see them as being addicted certainly that's a, a, a term that will get used much later on in their lives but I suppose when a young person is developing and growing we we look and approach the problem from that of a problematic drug and alcohol use and in the context that that's I suppose something that can be can change and they're growing and they're making sense and They've made some very bad decisions, maybe by the mm. time they've got to us. So there's an awful lot of shame coming in, in the door. Like, I'm sure, you know, I often do say to parents, like, you know, imagine yourself as an adult going in and sitting in front of a counsellor and then add in a bit of shame and add in addiction and add in potentially dual diagnosis. So a lot of mm. our young people may be diagnosed or undiagnosed pieces. So there's and a maybe package there explain of anxiety. dual diagnosis, because for the listeners, they may not be clear oh, yeah. what that means. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, dual diagnosis means a young person may have another diagnosis from a different service. So we may have young people who have a diagnosis of autism. They may have a mental health diagnosis where they may have depression or anxiety or stuff like that. So that would be called dual diagnosis where they may have a substance use issue and an underlying mental health issue as well. And are these kids more not susceptible, but are they more vulnerable to 
Yeah, you know, I think I think we we know now that all of our brains work differently. So we 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 would use the term neurodiverse and neurodivergent. So we would recognize that all all of us are neurodiverse, like none of our brains work the same way. Mm-hmm. In the past, we would have said neurotypical neurodiverse, but now we see that everybody might be neurodivergent. So now we kind of look at that for young people who are neurodiverse, like they may have a learning issue, they may have autism, they may have ADHD, they may have dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, yeah. all of those kind of things actually make their brain work differently. Okay. And if they're exposed to substances or really begin to use substances, it's going to affect them differently than it would yeah. somebody who has none of these issues. Yeah, um, that so makes th- sense when you say it yeah. out. And their relationship with substances, because when we talk about substances, we talk about young people developing a relationship with substances and the relationship becomes very deep and it can, you know, throw every other relationship out of their lives. It can Mm. become their best friend. Overwhelming, their best friend. You always say Mm, that. Yeah, Yeah, it's like, you know, the substance becomes their best friend. Yeah. You know, and our kind of role is to try and undermine that relationship and try and look at, okay, do you really want that as a best friend? Yeah. Or have you other things in your life that actually can replace that and give Mm. you that same. And working through that, it must be Uh difficult with children and it's, you know, even and children with dual diagnosis it must be so difficult for them to come to get to grips with that absolutely and and I suppose unfortunately there is a lot of young people coming who have not actually received a diagnosis maybe for some of the kind of areas that they're having difficulty with so we've kind of always have to keep that in the back of our minds too and to be fair like it's helpful to have a diagnosis but also it's about trying to just understand where this young person is in their world and what their life experience is like at that time and trying to make sense of what are the blocks. They're obviously, if they're in front of us, they're using substances to cope with whatever's going on. And they're, they're, the, the truth is it doesn't matter who they are, where they're coming from. Most of the young people's confidence is in their boots okay. for whatever reason. So, Emma, you're talking about coping mechanisms that children have or young people have and sometimes they're just at a difficult stage in their life and they start to use substances to try and help them cope. Yeah. So how do you then help them develop or to cope yeah. with all yeah. of the all of the things that they're dealing with? Yeah, I just 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 on that, just to, I suppose, just to clarify that we're talking about adolescence and adolescence is a, is a time of change and figuring out who you are and your identity, where you fit in the world. What we probably don't want to hear as parents and I'm a parent myself is experimenting with substances, kind of part of that kind of curiosity and experimentation. But there has to be there's a for those who get stuck and it is a minority, but those that do get stuck, there there is something about that cohort of young people that there's more going on. OK, so, yeah, understanding it from the point of view of they are struggling to cope with whatever's going on in their life. And it is our job as a, as a as a team and as a collective to kind of try and understand that from the young person's perspective, the, from the parent's perspective and kind of put together, I suppose, a plan of how we're going to address it. And the addressing of it, of it you know, it, it can look really different and it should look very different for each young person that comes in the door, really, because they're coming with a different set of needs. But it will obviously always involve direct therapy by myself or one of the other clinicians on the team. And it will obviously involve parental work and family therapy yeah. work. And tell us a little bit about the parental work and family mm-hmm. work, because I think that just sounds like such a great service. Yes, you're looking at after the young person, but obviously the bigger picture, mm-hmm. they need yeah. that scaffolding around them oh, to yeah. help them cope with it. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, and I mean, it's brilliant that you use that word because we would yeah. use it quite often with parents around scaffolding. So we kind of look at for parents, we know when they come through the door of our service, a huge amount of fear comes in the door with them into your office. So the fear of, OK, what's going to happen my, to my child? How are they going to be? So a lot of our work, first of all, is actually making connection with the parents and looking what, at what are their strengths. Number one, they've managed to identify that there's something going on. They've been alert and aware enough to know that something's happening. That's not mm. right. And then they've looked for help, which is a huge step for parents. Absolutely. To because confidence. there is a huge amount of fear of being judged, fear of, you know, if I walk 
walk through the store and are they going to think I'm a bad parent? Yeah. All of that sort of stuff. We have to work with parents with that because we're a non-judgmental service. So a lot of the time parents can feel OK, if I go up there, they're going to really think, oh, God, I did a terrible job. Or would parents <laughs> probably be afraid that you'd get Absolutely. social services yeah. involved oh, or yeah, you get social workers fear. and then yeah. depending on where they're from uh-huh. or what they've been through themselves. Yeah. There could be exactly. a real fear of any kind of. Yeah health yeah. service, you know. But again, I mean, we would always say no matter what a parent has been or done in their own past, we don't judge. Yeah. You know, we have parents who are in their own recovery. We have parents who are still maybe still tipping away at substances. We mm. will kind of work with them while their young person is coming to us. We ask them to minimise the amount of substance yeah. use that's going on. Now, that can be a huge conversation because you may have an I'm older sure. brother or sister living at home with a p- parents because we know that young p- older adults are young ad- adolescents and young adults in their 20s and 30s aren't able to move out. So you yeah. could have a very complicated household. So Emer and I mean, I think the first one of the first times I started in Yoda, I mean, one of my first family sessions, I think about seven people in the in the room with me. And Bobby was kind of going, <laughs> what is she doing? Yeah, <laughs> Do yeah. You know? Because I had granny and I had older brother and we had, you know, girlfriend of older brother, all of that in the room. And they were me. all living. And so were all you're there. talking about kind of really yeah. blended families that the yeah. new modern yeah. Ireland, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And that is difficult mm-hmm. for those kids. Yeah. And we also have families from different cultures. So we would have a lot of families who were coming from a different culture into Ireland yes. and trying to cope with a teenager who's born in Ireland, growing up in Ireland, but may have very different values from where they grew mm. up. So you have all of that happening as well. You know, that parents are struggling with the cultural piece too. Oh, it's no joke. It really yeah. It's very yeah. difficult. So our really work is. is is kind of with the parents. So we use a kind of program called Nonviolent Resistance where we actually have a program that we work with the parents as well, which actually helps them to deal with some of the um, things that the young person might be doing. But in reality, what it does is it helps to empower parents to control what they're doing um, okay. and to try and build a relationship with the young person. Because our young person, if they're using substances, will have very much that relationship with the substances will have meant that they will have pulled away from parents and they okay. will have excluded them from their lives a lot. Mm. So it's about building that connection back again. And that's it. Mm. I suppose we'd often say connection, connection, connection. Uh-huh. I suppose, I suppose as Monica has, has really clearly kind of outlined there, young people when they're a substance use and they've pulled back kind of from everybody, particularly mm. when it's become problematic. And that's why like we obviously have a, a specialised piece role in this journey for the young person. But it will probably have taken a lot of other people to encourage and get the family to actually come into us in the first place. So there's yes. a, I suppose it's important that we're kind of clear about our part is mm. is one part in, in, a, in a journey of recovery, really, for the family. Yeah. But we would really see the importance of o- other community members yeah. and family oh, yeah. members as actually being able to like it's amazing. Like I have often heard, you know, you, so many young people kind of saying to me, Jesus, I don't want my granny to know what I'm doing because yeah. if she hears she's going to kill me and I, like in my head I'd be going right we've got to get granny in <laughs> yeah. yeah because you can influence but that's them. where leverage that's yeah. where the leverage is yeah. you know and if there's one person in the family that that kid does not want to disappoint well that's that's where we Could start be because there, that's where yeah. the relationship actually is yeah. and you know, what we do know is, you know, that the further out we can get a young person to 18 and into adulthood where they've had, you know, as little as possible, you know, exposure to substances, the better it is for their growing brain. All the research tells us that the outcomes for young people who are not engaged in substances is far better down the line. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. I suppose our wish for every young person that we're working with is that they're they're getting that chance really to yeah. to understand that. And Emer, if we track back and if we track back a bit now, so we're obviously the kids who come to you, it's been identified that there is a, an issue there yeah. or they're coping and they're using substances. But we track back now when we're talking about your average 12 year old, 13 year old young person. What are parents looking for? What does it look like when I'm thinking there's something just not right? What 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 do I see every day? Like what's the presentation? Yeah, yeah. what is the mm-hmm. presentation? Mm-hmm. And again, it's supposed to depend on the kid. It can look different, but for some young people, it will be you'll start to notice kind of like school school issues tends to be kind of with some of the more obvious, clear bit of evidence where maybe grades are dropping. Okay, they're kind of making an excuse about not getting up in the morning. They're harder to motivate. There's probably a bit more of a mood issue and maybe an oppositionality between the parent and the young person. We're like, no, I'm not doing it, or you can't make me. But you know, then often people say, ah, oh, well, you know. They're only 
They it's a teenager, teenager. Teenager. So that's what they're like. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But it's, is it a significant change in their behavior? So you have two different kinds of kids. You've got, I suppose, the young people who are expressing their emotional kind of discontent outwardly. And then what that that can look like, you know, banging doors, you know, not not rolling with any kind of rules or expectations that were normally there and they might have always reasonably complied with. But there's a sudden change. Then you've got the other young people, I suppose, where it's quite internal and they've become very quiet in themselves, become distant yeah. from everybody. They're they're not going to the normal family kind of gatherings that they might normally typically have done. And I suppose there's a couple of pockets of evidence happening at school, it's friends, it's it's the mm-hmm. family system. Yeah. There's there's change in a couple of different domains. Mm. And I suppose when parents get curious and they start asking questions, and I think that's the best place to start. You know what's coming to mind is that's fine if parents notice. Yeah. But no, if parents don't. are maybe living a chaotic life themselves yeah. and nobody is really looking at the child or the young person as a whole, they're not they're not really being followed. Yeah. Or monitored, which in many cases, that's what happens because people are busy and they just have different things going on in their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, those kids must really fall through the cracks or maybe they can fall through the cracks. And some of those young people, unfortunately, do fall through the cracks. Yeah. Uh, parental presence and keeping a, a strong eye on what, what's going on during adolescence is probably one of the key messages that we probably will try mm-hmm. and deliver here yeah. today. Okay. Adolescence is a really challenging time and I... I know every generation has kind of said, oh, when we were younger, it was different. But Mm. I I really think with the whole introduction of social media and their lives are pretty much dictated by it now, there's an awful lot more that adolescents have to try and navigate. And they're getting influenced by strong messages that actually at times can be stronger what the parental or community message might Mm. be, because that's maybe what they're spending more time listening to. So, but yes, unfortunately, some of those young people can fall through the cracks and but I mean there's lots of research around one good adult Mm -hmm. and you know it could be a a basketball coach it could be a teacher there are lots of people keeping eyes on kids and it's you know there there are a lot of people that would probably initially make that initial prompt to the parent to think there's something wrong think maybe we need to keep an eye on you know and, and, and trust your instinct as well oh my god yeah. so good, good, good. Mm. yeah you said instinct. that yeah it's, yeah it's always about your instincts yeah. you know because teenagers and adolescents it's a very difficult it's a time of change anyway mm. you know parts of their brain are developing really quickly other parts aren't developed at all and and you're kind of looking at you want them to be able to explore you want them to have mm. a you know a social life and be have fun and interact with other peers but on the other side how do you monitor that how do you yeah. make sure that that scaffolding that you mentioned earlier there is 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 there so that parents are providing that scaffolding and it might not be parents it might be adult caregivers it mm. could be an older brother or sister if the parents aren't able to yeah. to do that or you know because we've people in loads of different care arrangements as well yeah so Monica I know that you have tips for parents on how to help your child develop resilience do you want to tell us a little bit about mm-hmm. that I think yeah particularly when we're talking about drug and alcohol issues mm. You know, we really are looking at parents being aware, first of all, building a relationship with your child and not after things have started to go wrong. It's actually needs to be before that. So when your child is going into, you know, from primary school to secondary school, it's that's when really parents have to be hyper kind of aware of what's happening building relationship with other parents, particularly, you know, because your child is moving into a new area. Um, So we would see a lot of parents coming up who don't know who the other parents are that their young person is hanging around with or they haven't done that that kind of intensive work. So we would say network with other parents is really important. Building a relationship with your young person so that even if they know that you're not going to like what they're saying to you, that they still feel confident to come and talk to you about it. Because a lot of the time that's what our young people mightn't be doing in the substance use area where they, they're trying to protect their parents mm. as well. So they don't want them to upset so parents. So all of this information you're giving me now or you're t- we're giving our listeners is, I'm sure it's coming from direct from young people that you've taken care of in the past. Yeah. This is what yeah. your young people are telling yeah. you that they need. Yeah. I like yeah. a young person the other day and uh, he's actually finishing up with us now and doing great. And uh, I was like, you know, what's what's the one thing that kind of helped or changed things? Now, obviously, he told me how amazing it was coming to us. But apart- oh, well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> that's nice to hear, Emer, and I'm sure you are. <laughs> Very important. Yes. Yeah. But what he said was, it's ma'am knowing where I am and stepping it up. And she's wide to 
I suppose how to spot things now when I'm up to things I shouldn't be up to. A lot of that was through the work with the family therapist. And and that was Mm -hmm. really, really important. So Mm. like I really, I I am a psychotherapist myself and it's really important that we kind of give the message that sending your child to singular therapy on its own and not providing parents with a support scaffold around how to navigate this. This is really challenging How do they know how to deal with them or what to look out for? It's too difficult. So, but I suppose I do worry about the parents. I think I'll send them to a therapist and, and that'll fix this by itself and a more robust kind of response. It is about looking to get parental support as well yeah. at, the sa- at the same time, because then you're being equipped. Yeah. To and I mean, it. we would always say the parents are the experts on their yes, own children. Of course. We're in their child's life for a few months, do mm-hmm. you know? And it was um, just you're saying about time, I guess, how long is a piece of string? Yeah. How, long mm-hmm. would, how long would young people be in your service for? Or on average, do you have an average? Even? Yeah. So I suppose the typical probably be about six months, six, three to six yeah, months. Okay. Three to six months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but we would also yeah. be working for some young cases, young people. We'd have cases that we'd be working with the mental health services as well. As well. So yeah. That's great. That's though. So you'd be liaising with them Absolutely. and making sure that yeah. the same message has just yeah. been given. And yeah. And is it difficult to get it, parents? Is it difficult to get the whole family in. I mean, I can't imagine the complexities of some of the families that you deal with. It absolutely can be. It can be. Yeah, it can be because, again, uh, parents can find it. They fear judgment. Mm. They fear, you Mm. know, that somebody's going to tell them, oh, you've done this really badly wrongly, which we don't, by the Mm. way. But I I think a lot of the time we can have, particularly since the pandemic, families have become so different. Young, Mm. Young people have struggled through the pandemic. We have that as well. But I think also parents, it's really difficult if you have a service that is working nine to five. So we we work really hard to try and get dads in. So we would have appointments after, you know, five o'clock. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, because, again, if you shut your service at five and somebody can't facilitate something. um, So we knew we can do online appointments with parents. We do like to see them in person. You know, for maybe the first or second appointment. Yeah, to build up a relationship. But we've had them, parents sure. join in our parents group from Disneyland, you know, in Paris and, and they'll just other stick, countries. They'll just stick and with it. This is their appointment. This is it. They yeah. see the benefit of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I suppose, and, and, and the core bit of our work is really, really building that relationship between the young person and mm. the parent. And the, I suppose the parent have maybe a better understanding of what might be hard for the kid yeah. and, and why are they leaning into substances to mm. help them regulate these difficult emotions? You yeah. Know? So yeah. There's, there's, that's really where the, the, the real work is, you know, is of trying course. to kind of help yeah. the parent kind of understand that picture. Help the parent kind of understand that. And then because we're kind of co-working with, so family therapy is co-working with the individual work as well. So a lot of the time we'd go in together, mm. you know, and then we'd, we'd have parents and young person and ourselves in the room you know, where we can actually celebrate the things that are going to help. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. like when a young person doesn't use substances and actually deals with an emotion yeah. and is able to mm. go to go to parents and say, look, you know, I went into school, it was really hard, but I came home and I was fine. I had my sandwich and all of well, that. Well, they're probably yeah. delighted with themselves. Just, just small senses yeah. of achievement that help them with their confidence. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. it. And I suppose it's even though I suppose we're considered like a more of a treatment service in the community, I suppose it still is an early intervention. And the sooner and earlier people can get in, I uh-huh. suppose the better, you know, the yeah. better the outcomes are for exactly. people, you know. Yeah. This is all uh, when we've been doing these podcasts, everything is early intervention. Don't wait. Mm-hmm. Early intervention. If you have an inkling, mm. go and get help. There's help there if you look for it. I mean, mm-hmm. we yeah. all know that there's waiting lists in certain areas. We know mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But people are working behind the scenes to try and improve those. But there yeah. are, mm-hmm. there is help there. So, Emer, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, you mentioned earlier on before we started the podcast about the language that parents use around each other and sometimes are around the young person and sometimes maybe if parents aren't together or if they're yeah. there's like we say blended families and one parent is pitting the other parent against each yeah. other and it's really difficult for children. Yeah I suppose for me it's probably one of the unfortunately it's something I, I hear a lot from young people of where they will talk about how let's say I'll take an example of a, of a, of a mum and dad spitting and the dad maybe has done kind of things which have been really challenging and putting the family in under a lot of stress and that boy or that girl being told well, you're just like your dad and yeah. you know in a moment of you know the mum might be under pressure and upset and stressed and the kid has kind of broken some rule but unfortunately because adolescence is a time of figuring out who you are and then your and your identity when you start to hear a 
pair and say that you, you might be bad just like they are and the kids would simplify things. They're not mm-hmm. going to put a kind of a complex understanding on it. The internalization of that for a kid is it's just hugely damaging and, and actually can take a bit of time to kind of unravel and help the kid to kind of realize, no, you actually are a little bit of your mom, a little bit of your dad. Yeah. And actually you're a big bit of yourself. Yeah. And for them know. to realize that, that yeah. they are themselves and yeah. it's OK to be but yourself. It, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing of peer pressure, yeah. peer pressure, I think, is such a huge thing for kids. And I know yeah. we spoke about social yeah. media. Yeah. How do we help kids deal with this whole peer pressure thing when it comes to substance misuse? I think it is really difficult because it, there's so much kind of availability. You know, we know when availability goes up um, that people have difficulty in avoiding um, mm. substances. And I think if you're looking at if you're a young person who's either neurotypical or neurodiverse and trying to fit into a peer group, a lot of the time, you know, even though your your own kind of family values might be slightly different, you still will feel, OK, if I, I need to join in with this. Yes. So avoiding peer pressure and how to deal with peer pressure. Again, we would say to parents to actually talk to your young person about it, mm. um, you know, allow them to tell you if things aren't going well in their group. You know, we often expect our young people to be strong enough. You know, the old Nancy Reagan thing of just say no. Yeah. But there's very few of our young people who will be able to be strong enough to stand up to their peer group. So sometimes we ask parents to step into that space because we often have young people who come up to us who would say, oh, their parent is really strict. We can't use that in their house. Yeah, you know? interesting. And and you're kind of saying, yeah, great. You know, good yeah, on you. Yeah, um, yeah. Because a lot of the time parents feel, well, I can't, you know, I can't put in too many boundaries because they're going to lose friends. Mm. But particularly, we would say for parents to step into that place and say, look, I really don't want you using X, Y, Z substances. Um, mm. And that means that a young person can go into their peer group and say, well, my man and dad would go ballistic. I yes, can't yeah, do so that. they can use so that. They have a way out of saying, yeah. you know, my parents are really strict, I can't go home. Mm. So we need to be teaching young people this early, uh-huh. kind of like you said, in national school, secondary school. But you, yeah. I know that it's it is in some of the curriculums and that, uh-huh. but I suppose it just needs to be spoken about more. Yeah. It's okay for parents to have expectations. And yeah. Act, like we'd encourage parents to have expectations. It's okay to expect your child not to do this. And mm-hmm. but it's it's important to give them the tools around it. And I suppose mm, yeah. reminding ourselves that adolescence is all about being part of your herd. Who who do I belong to? What's my group? Young people who have, you know, clubs and activities and places they can go to be themselves, the more of that they have in their lives, the better chances that mm. even if this becomes an issue, it it doesn't stay stuck. They can, if you know, it can become a non-issue because they have other groups to kind of lean on, mm. in on. So I suppose when a young person is in front of me and we, they get to a point where they're kind of saying, this name, I really want to stop all of this. I suppose that's where we start. We start mm. to look at what peer groups they're in, what other groups are in their community, where might they have maybe an even a a connection where there is less substances or no substances Mm. and how might they begin to build that connection. So like it takes a village to rear a child um, and yeah, keeping an eye on what's going on in your village and what's available to your children to kind of keep them involved. Absolutely. Look, I think we can't avoid the alcohol question and allowing children to drink at home. So what's your opinions or what's your advice for parents on that? I think we both take that separately. Monica, you might. Yeah, I think for me, I would say the longer that we can keep young people away from alcohol, the better, you know, and I think particularly what we would say is you have to model what you want to see. Mm. Okay, so if if parents are coming home on Friday night and saying, right, I've had a really stressful weekend cracking open the bottle of wine and that's happening two or three times a week, you're going to model that for your young person. So we need to be modeling what we Mm. want to see. Again, we know that for young people, alcohol, depending on their brain chemistry and depending on their makeup, for some neurodiverse young people, alcohol is not great for them uh, because, again, it'll, it'll make life more difficult. It can dial up their sensory system or it can dial it down, which makes them less acute around risk. They may not be able to see risk. Um, mm. So a lot of the time we're looking at, you know, what does alcohol do to a young person's brain? And the longer that we can keep that away from a young person's brain, the better. Now, I mean, we are in Ireland. We are in Irish culture. So so we know that lots of families coming from different places will have difficulty with this. Mm. You know, we have some cultures where alcohol is more accepted 
and it's introduced earlier. And again, people would look at that, but they have a very different relationship and culture around alcohol, mm. whereas we have a real binge culture in Ireland mm. around alcohol. And that's been known for many, many years. And so, again, you're kind of looking at trying to give people a message, trying to give young people a message that alcohol, we want them to have a relationship with alcohol that's going to last their whole life. Yeah. If they get into trouble with alcohol early, that relationship is not going to be there. Yeah. I think that that's really important to kind of look at. You have to treat it with respect mm. and you have to treat it responsibly. And if mm. you don't do that, it'll bite you. That's a really, uh, it's a lovely way to, uh, if you can describe it in a lovely way, it is a really, it's a non-judgmental way as well, that the way that you've described it there, Monica. But I guess, Emer, the so the advice really is to say to parents yeah. as much as possible, well, yeah. encourage your kids. every chemical really. I mean, yeah. Like, as I look at substances from a chemical perspective, whether it's mm. alcohol or cannabis, you know, and um, there is a lot of families that would obviously engage in cannabis use as well as parents, mm. adults at, at the weekend or on a Friday evening. And if young people are watching, what, how you, how do you wind down? What do you do when you're very, very stressed? They're going to they're going to model on that a little bit as well. Yeah. And, and so as we have had a lot of young people kind of saying to us, well, you know, I'm in here and they're telling me to sort out my whatever use and they're doing what they do at the weekend. So you, 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 kids are not stupid either. Like, mm. you know, so it's we've kind of asked parents to kind of watch that and that's not I mean I'm a parent myself of teenagers it is not an easy certainly the alcohol piece is certainly not an, an easy piece to tackle but I would say recognise the fact that young people like being together you can still ha- allow that to happen mm. and you can still make that fun and interesting and, and you do need to think about how you're going to make it fun and interesting ask them yeah mm. ask just them. ask keep them. them involved keep talking to them get uh-huh. their opinions and listen to what they're telling you yeah. I mean, one of the parents that we had a great way of doing it, like that they actually said they opened up the back garden. Yeah. They donated the back garden to the young people. And the mm. only kind of rules around it where you couldn't bring alcohol or substances in, but like that, it just meant that their young people had had some place to go. Place to go. Yeah. yeah. And had a place where that, that they could actually just be themselves. And just know, be a safe and, environment. Kind and, of. Uh, yeah. Parents had to turn a blind eye at the back. Of, you yeah, know, yeah. Not look pull the you. curtains. <laughs> you know. But don't turn a blind eye. Yeah. And I, yeah. if, the, if I'm being honest, I think there is a little bit of turning blind eyes goes on at mm. times in certain mm. families. And yeah. you're not doing your child any favour by doing that or minimising mm. it or normalising that as that's just to be teenagers. You do need to tackle it means that you, they're not going to be too delighted with you, but mm-hmm. it's better mm-hmm. to address these issues. And we didn't talk go. about, actually, Marie, we didn't talk about the peer pressure from other parents. Yes, I know. think that's bigger. <laughs> yeah, really yeah, no, that's huge. great. That's a really important yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, I mean, peer pressure from other parents can be quite high as well. You know, we would have parents who would say that, well, all of the parents in my young person's year, they're all allowing them to drink at home. And and why why can I be different? Can I do mm. it differently? You know, um, yeah, or, or, you know, they go for sleepovers yeah. and like sleepovers is definitely a big one where there's there's a fair amount of drinking and drug use happening kind of in, in some in some families. And like we were kind of saying, like, if, if the substance use is happening during the sleepover, well, then the most obvious place to start tackling is the sleepovers. Yeah. You know, sometimes this stuff can sound actually very complicated. But in, in, in other ways, it's it's sometimes it's a simple approach mm. and kind of reminding parents, you are actually the best expert on your child. Mm. Mm-hmm. Give your space, self time and space to reflect. And if you think you can't get your child to a, a therapist to work on these issues, you go to the therapist mm. to get assistance with how you might work on the issues. And we would have yeah. some families who would say, I can't get so-and-so to come up to you. We would say, that's grand. Our family therapist will meet with you for a couple of That's sessions. Brilliant. So then you deal of how to deal with that. it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That sounds fantastic mm-hmm. because then you'll be able to talk to the person. You'll yeah. know how to mm-hmm. react. Like you won't yeah. overreact. Yeah. 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 And you're teaching them the skills. And I mean, that's, that's kind of what happens. Yeah. Like a lot of the parents that we would deal with, you know, whereas so they're working on their own activation, their own kind of somebody comes through the door. They may have, you know, they may be affected by alcohol or other substances or they may come in, you know, with cannabis on board and parents kind of immediately are getting activated. And, and the problem is to, to kind of one of the things that happens is they will try and deal with the situation immediately. And mm. we would always say that... Uh, a sign of when 
when our parent begins to reflect and say, OK, I'm not going to deal with this now. I'm going to tackle this in the morning. And, you know, so a lot of the time the parents are dealing with their own activating mm. really is a way because they're afraid and they're scared by what's happening. Um, mm. So sometimes it's when we, when we can hear a parent who says, right, I had this situation happen, but I stayed. I didn't. I pressed the pause button. I kept calm. I didn't get activated. I walked away and I said, I'll come back to you in five minutes and talk to you about yeah. it. Or, but we actually got a call yesterday from yeah. a parent and she, they were finished up with this as well. And she was like, I'll never forget the day he told me I needed just to stop and just press the pause button. And, yeah. she, and she she left a few expletives there telling me what she thought of me at the time. <laughs> and she said, you know what? She said, only for you. If, if, if I hadn't mm. listened to that, uh, that, that advice. And she said when she started to see that advice was actually working, that's when the trust in that this if we, if she sticks with this it's going to work and it has worked and mm. so for me that's one of the biggest messages yeah. we want to give here is that I actually we love what we do because well it comes we out see I mean, it's, it's it's fantastic we to do. know and, that and you and love what you do come to us we just think they're amazing and brave and brilliant and they come with lots of things to teach us actually mm -hmm. and they have the parents and well, the parents young people have taught, have taught us, taught us so much mm. you know that a lot of the things that we pass on to parents are actually Tips from other parents. parents. Yeah. Things yeah. that they've tried, things that they've used, yeah. way they've handled different situations that have actually worked with their young person, you know, because mm. again, that's really coming from a place where parents have tried and tested some of these yeah. things, you know, so yeah. that's what really works for them and really works yeah. for the young people. That's brilliant. And it, look, I suppose we need to come to an end. We've been talking for a long time. I think there's a lot more to talk about, but it, Look, there's been a lot of messages that we've given to parents and, and people that are listening and we hope that it helps them in some way and we know that they can go to drugs.ie. But if you were to give, I suppose, a nugget of advice, Emer, and I'll come to you then, Monica, as well, to give you the final word and what do you think? What's the nugget if you're noticing or, or I suppose, what's the nugget of advice you'd give to parents around this whole area? Listen, I'm a parent myself and... The one thing that screams at me the whole way through this is connection, mm. connection, connection. And be prepared that when your child goes from primary school to secondary school, they're going to change and they're going to try and disconnect from me. And that's totally normal. But you've got to keep that relationship with mm. them. Don't accept that they're going to completely disconnect just because they're teenagers. You got to keep working on that relationship. Mm. That's really that's good. Your, that's your biggest place to be able to influence change. Mm. And Monica, I think, yeah, for me, I think that the main one is parental presence and also parents being an effective team, not pulling against one another as mm. in my, yeah. we, we need to do it this way or we need to do it that way. Actually sitting down as parents and talking about, OK, how are we going to handle this? Yeah. And who's the best person to talk to the young person? And do we need other help you mm. know, to bring that in? And that's really important. And if you're bringing in other help, as in, you know, asking for advice from friends or family, family members or whatever. It's not to disempower yourself. It's actually to get what other parents have tried that has worked. Mm. So it um, doesn't mean that you're failing. It just means no. that you're asking for advice. I think yeah. that's so important mm -hmm. or asking for help. Yeah. And the truth is from the cradle to the grave, aren't mm -hmm. we all going to need help with something at some Absolutely, stage? Yeah. And that's what we we see that as being part of just that trajectory of change in someone's life. I don't know about you, but I know I've had to ask people for help at different oh, stages absolutely. in my life. And, yeah. and that is OK. Yeah, it is OK. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if just to our listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us about the podcast, please send us an email to healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie. And that email address is in the podcast information wherever you're listening to this. As always, we'd like to ask you that to please share this episode with a colleague or a friend or a family member who you think would be interested in this topic. I think there's a lot of information here and I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.